For a handful of the projects I have in the works, a common thread is a need for some sort of encoders to get some feedback on position while in use. Lucky for me, I recently got this fancy little laser cutter, which I think may be quite well suited for making those happen for me. There are a number of different encoders I'd like, from linear to rotary to more experimental, but I don't have a ton of experience with laser cutters, and even if I did, I really want some characterization of these encoders if I want to be able to trust the accuracy of the positional feedback they give me. So to get a start on this, I decided to build myself a linear encoder tester. The basic idea here is a fairly straightforward linear translation stage with modular mount locations for encoders and read heads that allow me to easily swap out different combinations. The plan is to then pair it up with this displacement sensor to quantify the positional accuracy and repeatability of these different encoder builds before strapping them into their forever home. But before diving into that, let's take a quick look at what I mean when I say encoders and read heads. The linear encoders that I'm primarily focused on here are based on glass scales that you may have encountered strapped into the stage of a machine tool. Those glass scales have a repeating pattern of metalized lines along them, so they alternate between transmitting and reflecting light shined from the side. And shining light from the side is exactly the job of the reed head that sits alongside the glass scale. For a transmission-based reed head, which is what I'm going to be aiming for, at least to start, one side has an emitter and the other side a detector. Yep, that's right, I'm yet again breaking out the old opto-interrupters for this one. So the scale gets fixed to one side, say the rigid frame, and the reed head gets attached to the part moving relative to it. As the reed head moves along the scale, the detector puts out a series of on-off pulses. One issue with this pulse output is that it's not possible to tell what direction the reed head's moving along the scale. To tackle this, most reed heads use this fancy sounding technique of quadrature. By adding a second emitter detector pair that's 90 degrees out of phase with the first, it's possible to get both position and direction. In addition, since they're out of phase with each other, this can also be used to improve the measurement resolution, since there are twice as many rising and falling edges to detect. But to take full advantage of this, I need some measure of the as-built features like detector spacing, grading pitch, etc. And the encoder tester is intended to help me put some numbers to these. Also, since this is my first laser cutter slash engraver, I want to test out things on the gratings like what sort of minimum spacings are possible without breaking the webs. What effect does laser power and translation speed have on edge effects? And can I use the laser's built-in precision mode in any way to fine-tune these edges? And in addition to these laser tuning variations, I'm also curious to try out some slightly less traditional variations, like cutting a sawtooth or sine wave profile to use the analog regime of the detector to further increase the resolution. I also I also want to try out impregnating wooden encoders with UV resin to improve their durability and stability. So many fun activities. Sorry, I got a little carried away there for a sec. How about we get back to the topic at hand and take a closer look at what's going to do the testing. The base is this small optics breadboard, and it provides the mounting for all the static components. On each end of these mount blocks that hold the 500mm linear guide rods, and just on the outside of the mount blocks are the motor mount on this side and idler pulleys on the other. I decided to go with these geared DC motors because I have several of them of different gear ratios laying around, which will allow me to easily test a range of different motion speeds. The motor turns this timing belt pulley that I printed on the resin printer, and the belt attaches to the moving carriage in a pretty similar way to what you'd find on the most hobbyist 3D printers, with one side of the loop rigidly attached to the carriage, and the other side just recirculating underneath. The encoder being tested gets mounted to the base plate right in the middle of the track. I tried to space the components to allow the encoder to sit directly between the rails, or as close to it as possible to minimize the abbey errors. Before jumping up to take a look at the carriage itself, there's a design concept that plays a few roles in it that's worth chatting about a bit first. And that's the concept of exact constraint, or kinematic constraint. Basically, the idea is to use only the number of contact points required to constrain the degrees of freedom you want to constrain. If you've ever come across a three-legged stool, you've encountered an exact constraint. Three points to find a plane, so three points of contact on a flat, aka planar, floor is all that's needed. Those three points constrain the Z movement as well as rotations about the X and Y. The stool can still slide side to side and forward and back, as well as rotate around freely, with the exception of friction. While there's some additional subtleties to it, each point of contact basically limits one degree of freedom. So three points of contact, three degrees of freedom constrained. And now taking a look at the carriage, we can see straight away one of the more classic examples of kinematic constraint, the Maxwell clamp. The Maxwell coupling features three V grooves, all pointing toward a shared center point. And the other side of the coupling, in this case the reed head, have three spheres that will sit inside of those grooves. Each sphere touches its V at two points, so six points of contact in total, given a full six degrees of freedom constrained. How about that? One of the really useful, and in my opinion really cool, aspects of a Maxwell coupling is that even if the base and mating parts are made from materials of different thermal expansion, the center point's maintained. Not really an attribute that drove my choice to use it here, but I just find it so damn clever. But anywho, 
I chose to put the reed head on a kinematic mount so that I could easily and repeatably swap out different reed heads and ensure their position and alignment's consistent. The V-grooves are made using these rectangular bar magnets, allowing them to also provide the preload to hold the coupling together. The magnets also provide a smoother, stiffer interface for the point contacts with the balls than a printed V-groove would. I've used the same type of design quite a few times, and for this old rotary table build I measured the positional repeatability of the mount to be better than 3 microns. I don't really expect to need that level of positional repeatability on this build, but the angular alignment could be important. Plus, it's a pretty cheap and easy interface to design in, so why not? There are also threaded inserts here for the belt attachment points. These attachment points just have some slots to feed through the end of the belt, and then tightening these down against the surface of the carriage secures the belt in place with friction. These other V-grooves and inserts are for the sensor, but more on that in just a sec. First, let's take a look at how the carriage rides along the linear rails. At first, I built it to have the carriage ride on recirculating ball linear bearings that I had laying around, but after assembling it, I realized those had some play in them, and I was worried those would introduce unexpected uncertainties I'd have to chase down later. So I instead decided to once again reach into the exact constraint bag of tricks. I want only one degree of freedom, and that's linearly along the direction of the rails. So I put four steel dowels and a V configuration on one side, and just a single point of contact on the other. Five points of contact, five degrees of freedom constrained. One major limitation of this design is that these will be moving along the rail with sliding friction, which would be a bad choice for a typical motion stage because it would have terrible wear behavior. But a major assumption for this build is that the motion will typically be relatively slow, and it will likely only ever do tens or, at the most, low hundreds of cycles in total. So I decided I'd take the hit on wear in exchange for positional stability and repeatability. To provide preloads against these five contacts, I went with some PETG printed parts. So now we've got all the parts in place to do this! The only thing left is something to provide feedback on the actual motion, which will be what is used to compare against the encoder output and provide the calibration reference. And that takes us back to those other V-grooves we saw on top of the carriage. I'm pretty excited about what I now have to sit in those V-grooves, and that is this chromatic confocal displacement sensor. And in case you're watching this, a huge thanks to the folks out there that are responsible for me having it. You know who you are. I first came across chromatic and focal sensors about six or seven years ago, and they've been one of my very favorite sensors ever since. I won't dive into how they work here, but they're an optical non-contact measurement tool, and this particular version offers submicron accuracy over a 10mm range of motion. The 10mm range does present a bit of a challenge though, since I'm aiming to characterize encoders of 250mm or more. And that's where the last piece of this assembly comes in, and that's this target block here. It'll be positioned such that it's at the end of the sensor's measurement range. The target is then slid along the rails back to the far end of the measurement range again, then rinse and repeat. So the characterization of the encoder will be stitched together from these incremental measurements. From there, it's just a matter of comparing the encoder readings against the reference measurements. And that pretty much covers my new little linear encoder tester. If you'd be interested in seeing some of the test results as I put this fellow to use, let me know! And if you'd like to get one of these nifty Falcon 2 laser cutter engravers for yourself, you can find a link down below in the description. Thanks for watching, and hope you're building something fun!